You've tuned in to When Your Mind Becomes the Scene of the Crime Podcast. I'm Dr. Linda F. Williams. I take survivors of abuse and trauma from pain to purpose so that you take back your power, tap into the truth of who you are, and live your best life now. Almost all of us are familiar with the story of the Garden of Eden, wherein God put Eve and Adam in this garden, and it was paradise. All they had to do was name the animals. He gave them complete dominion over the Garden of Eden, and they lived there happily and peacefully. Well, eventually this situation came up where the serpent came into the garden and began to talk to Eve about the fact that when he put Adam in that garden, he told him, now you may not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Any other tree, fruit, whatever in this garden, you are free to eat, but you are to keep your hands off the fruit of that tree. Now, many do not recognize that In the center of the garden were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were both in the center of this garden. Now, we all know that eventually the serpent talked Eve into eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and in so doing, she wound up getting kicked out of the garden. But let's talk about the backstory. And that's something that we have to always consider is the backstory. Now, if you look at the conversation between Eve and this serpent, the serpent made it look like it was all about Eve. Okay. Oh, yeah. You just, you got to have this knowledge. You, you know, God just doesn't want you to have this knowledge, yada, 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 yada. It's all about her. It's all about her. And she fell for it. But that conversation wasn't about Eve at all. What that conversation was about was how that serpent was mad because he thought he was so much higher than God and wound up getting his rump kicked out of heaven. Now he's running rackets on God and he plans to do everything he can to mess up God's plan. So he decides he's going to go through the weak link in this whole thing and get these two human beings to do the goofy so that they are not reaping the benefits of paradise. While he was talking to Eve and feeding her this crock about her, 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 you want to get knowledgeable and you this and you that, what it was really about was his own rebellion and anger and trying to retaliate against God. This is the bottom line to the whole story. Eve didn't have to ascribe to that serpent's rebellion and bitterness. And what she did by virtue of biting into that fruit, we'll call it an apple. We know the Bible doesn't say it was an apple, but we'll call it an apple. What she did by biting into that apple was she traded her life for his Her harvest, which was paradise in the Garden of Eden, she traded it in that moment with that serpent. What did she wind up in the end getting or manifesting, as they say, in the secret and in in this whole law of attraction thing? What did she, she do? She traded her outcomes, her life, her destiny for the serpents. In the end, what happened? She got booted out of the garden forever. Adam too. Ah, oh, yeah, come on over here. I ate this fruit. Taste this. He knew better. Had told her better. They made the decision. And that's the other thing I want to talk about. Why would there be two trees in the middle of the garden? One that they were forbidden to eat, that held and brought forth the forbidden fruit. 
and one that was the tree of life. Now, if these both of these trees are in the middle of this garden this whole darn time, why is it they never ate from the tr tree of life? See, if they had eaten from the tree of life, then this whole thing would not have happened. But once they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they couldn't, God put them out because he said, okay, no, 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 no. You can't be eating from the tree of life now. You've already made your choice. And once you eat from the tree of life, then now you're going to live forever ever in this fallen state. Okay? No, you got to go. Just put them out. Now, the serpent perfectly happy because he had been successful in his backstory game plan to get them booted out of the garden just because he knew that paradise and they're living in that garden and living happily in that garden, well taken care of and everything. Because that was God's plan for these two human beings, he wanted anything but that. Running racket, rebellion. That was his rebellion. Okay. So she traded her harvest for his and got the same outcome, booted out of the garden. Now, we always, now in the church, now, I'm just telling you about in the church, and a lot of you who, who have a church background will get this. You know, we're always talking about, ah, oh, yeah, they shouldn't have this and they shouldn't have that. And we in this fallen state because Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, look, bottom line, you would have done no better, probably. Okay. They had a choice in that garden. That's one thing about it. Now, now it, 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 you got two trees in the middle of the garden, both in the middle of the garden. One you told not to eat from. Why? Because we always have choice. Free will is something that's been baked into the game plan. Free will. The power of choice. The decisions we make. Now, why am I telling you this? Because when we are traumatized, it throws off how we see everything in our world. Just throws it way off. It distorts it. it almost as bad as in the Matrix, when you saw the screen, it looked like it was a bunch of distortions and you really wouldn't see it clearly. Well, that's how it does us. Now, even if we have free will, we cannot make sound, powerful, destiny-driven decisions in a traumatized state because you ha have to see reality in order to make powerful, destiny- and purpose-driven decisions. When we are traumatized, especially if we're traumatized as children, it just throws us so far off in how we see the world that every decision we make is being made through traumatized glasses. We get stuck in survival mode. Now, I ain't mad at you. Survival mode gets you through. It's the reason you're still breathing. You made it through. You really deserve a feather in your cap and metal because you survived whatever you've been through. And we muddled through just in survival mode, survival mode. And we really need a tribe. That's the word I'm searching for. We need a tribe in order to walk us through this, in order to help us to understand when we're getting ready to make poor decisions in our lives, our relationships, our careers, whatever. Somebody that's going to be that 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 voice of realism and reality. Now, I'm going to give you a tool that's going to help you to determine how to develop a powerful tribe of people who are truthful, trusted others to help you to stay on course as you navigate thriving after trauma and abuse. Now, these people have to be people that you know have your best interests at heart, people that you know are not afraid to tell you truth, people that you know can withstand the emotional backlash that is inevitable when you first start out on your tribe journey, people that aren't afraid of it, and people who can stand it and st stand in truth out of love for you. 
these people, you got to know they have your best interest at heart. I'll give you the whole guidelines, the sheet worksheet, and all of the guidelines you need to determine whether or not these people. Now, this is also true. You may need a different tribe in your personal life. You might need another special tribe in your career or professional life. You may have multiple different tribes for different aspects of your life. But you can walk through this process using the worksheet and then it'll help you to determine how to develop the different tribes in different areas of your life. But always remember that it's important to see the backstory. We have a saying in, in the African-American community, beware the dog that brings a bone. Now, a lot of people think, okay, beware of the dog that brings the bone. That means if somebody's bringing you gossip, then they're taking back gossip on you too. But it goes so much deeper than that. When you look at the story of the, the, the tribe of Israel, and there are many such stories in life and in the Bible, the whole thing about them living in the land of milk and honey and in Goshen, where the Pharaoh had given them their own land and they were thriving and everything, all of that changed on a dime. Why? Because some fool came up to Pharaoh whispering in his ear a lie. Okay? You got to understand the Pharaoh that made promises to Joseph and gave them the better part of the land to live on, that that Pharaoh had long died. And the current Pharaoh didn't feel any obligation to any promises that other Pharaoh made to a bunch of Israelites. So what happened? It was still status quo. Everything was cool until the day some fool comes up whispering to Pharaoh a bunch of lies about, yeah, yeah, man, you want to be careful because, you know, they're getting pretty, pretty, quite a few of these Israelites over there in Goshen. You want to be careful because if they get too powerful, if they get too many in number, they might want to take over Egypt. That had never crossed that Pharaoh's mind. Everything was cool. Everything was good. Everything was status quo. Here come this fool bringing a bone. And then overnight, everything changed for the Israelites. They became slaves. They went into hard labor and eventually had to run for their lives. Why? Some fool brought a negative lion bone that started the whole darn thing. Now, I bet if you think about it, you can think of some stuff that happened in your own life kind of like that. Somebody back and telling a lie and then it just tears up your whole life. So I'm just saying it's important to know the backstory. If somebody's bringing you something, what's their ulterior motive? Are you surrounding yourself with truthful, trusted others that you know that if they're bringing you something, they're not trying to bring you something with an ulterior motive or trying to be jealous and, and trying to begrudge you anything? When you got a solid tribe around you of people who love you and who you can trust, even when your gut is churning because you've been triggered by some past trauma, you know that there's somebody in your life that you can trust to love you through it. I'm Dr. Linda F. Williams, and always remember your greatest power is realized in the truth of who you are. Know that truth. Thank you for joining us today for When Your Mind Becomes the Scene of the Crime podcast. To contact Dr. Linda, just go to whoseapple.org. That's W-H-O-S-E-A-P-P-L-E dot org. 